Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we can get started. I'm Luis da Silva. I'm the executive director of the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, CCI. Um, and if you are not familiar with CCI yet, um, we are an initiative of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and we have a mission of um, research, workforce development, and innovation at the intersection between cybersecurity, autonomous systems, and data slash artificial intelligence. Um, in this semester, we are running this um, uh, webinar series on the human side of cybersecurity, and we're really honored to have Dr. Craner join us um, and, and talk to us about some of her research. Um, before I pass the, the baton to um, Milish, um, I just want to have a couple of announcements. Um, this is being recorded, uh, and we'll make available the recording of this presentation on our YouTube channel. Uh, it usually takes a few days after the event uh, for it to appear in the CCI YouTube channel. So if you go to our website, um, cyberinitiative.org, um, you can have access to, to this, um, to the YouTube page and therefore the video. And the second announcement is if you have any questions, we'll take the questions at the end uh, and please use the Q&A box for that. So um, with that, I'll pass, um, the floor to Dr. Milish Manik. Um, he is um, organizing this wonderful webinar series. So Milish, um, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Louise. And thank you for uh, giving me uh, trust in, in uh, organizing this uh, spring series of uh, CCI uh, seminar series. Uh, again, today is February 18th, and we have a great pleasure of uh, hosting Dr. Lori Craner from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, Dr. Lori Craner is, um, uh, holds a number of, of titles, um, including four systems professor, computer science and engineering and public policy. She's director and Bosch distinguished professor in security and privacy technologies, Scilab Security and Privacy Institute. Um, in 2016, she served as chief technologist as the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. She is very highly cited, and uh, I would invite you um, to uh, take a look at her YouTube video on online security and privacy. Here is the link. Here, I uh, particularly like the acronym for CUPS: Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory. So again, my name is Milos Manic. I'm professor with VCU and CCI fellow, director of VCU Cybersecurity Center. And we have a pleasure of hosting today, Dr. Lori Craner. Lori, the podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And all right. So um, today I'm going to talk about security and privacy for humans. And you know, often when we talk about security and privacy, uh, we focus on the code and the systems and we don't talk enough about humans. So that's what I'm going to uh, focus on today. Uh, and this, this is indeed uh, the kind of work that I do um, with my students uh, in my lab at Carnegie Mellon. Okay, so um, when we hear about uh, security in the news, we do often hear about humans. Um, usually what we hear about is that humans are the weakest link. Um, we hear about human error. Uh, we hear that uh, we should blame humans for a lot of different types of cyber attacks. Uh, so who are all of these humans who are causing all these problems? Um, in computer security, we like to talk about threats and threat modeling. So let's talk about the human threat. And who, uh, who are these humans who pose this particular threat? Um, the humans that we talk about the most in computer security, I think, are malicious humans. So we have Eve the evil attacker and Mallory the malicious and um, any number of other uh, attackers in our systems. We spend a lot of time thinking about them and how to stop them. But there are a lot of other types of humans that also pose a threat to our secure system. So for example, clueless humans. 
uh, these are humans who don't realize that there was some sort of security critical task that they were supposed to have carried out or they don't know how to do it. Uh, we also have unmotivated humans. They, they may actually be aware that they're supposed to be doing something, um, but they just don't want to bother. Um, they may believe that it's somebody else's job. Uh, they may not have any incentives to do this themselves. And then we also have humans who are constrained by human limitations, which is pretty much all humans. Uh, so we are often given security tasks that are actually really hard for us to do. Uh, for example, memorizing large numbers of unique passwords, um, except for those people who are particularly good at, you know, say spelling uh, in elementary school, I, I was terrible at that. And so the idea of memorizing things has never been something that has come easy to me. And so uh, the amount of effort that it would take for me to memorize the number of passwords that I have um, is actually very large. Uh, on the privacy side, uh, we also hear that privacy is very confusing for users. And so um, internet companies are con constantly trying to uh, change their privacy settings and revise their privacy policies. Um, and then this uh, maybe is trying to help, but it just confuses people even more. Um, and uh, the reason that we have so much trouble with privacy is because, well, it's actually pretty complicated. Um, there are lots of different facets to privacy. There are conflicting goals. Um, they, we have, we have uh, privacy of our data, privacy of our personal space. Um, sometimes uh, some people's right to privacy uh, is going to conflict with uh, needs for community security. Um, so it's all very complicated. Now we've found in our research that um, despite all the complexity, there's definitely some advantage to trying to uh, examine together security and privacy and usability uh, so that we can address the human factors up front rather than just trying to build that secure system and then throwing it over the fence to the usability people to slap some usability on it. That tends not to work. We need to be thinking about humans, the users of the system and usability from the beginning. So I'm gonna to talk today about a number of user studies, usability studies um, uh, that we've done uh, in my lab at Carnegie Mellon. And one question that I often get from people is, so you're doing these security and privacy user studies. Isn't that just the same thing that everybody over in human computer interaction does with all their studies? What's so special about security and privacy user studies? And that's a great question. Um, the answer I think has to do with the presence of risk or an adversary. Uh, so, you know, if you think about the kinds of user studies that are done for any type of a software product, um, say we want to test the usability of some new features in a word processor. Uh, so we might have people type some text and insert tables and change the color of the text and things like that. Um, and we can see, you know, how, how well they understand how to do this. Um, but imagine if there was somebody who was deleting all their text as they were typing it. There was an adverse present. Um, and so in our uh, security and privacy studies, we often need to do that sort of thing so that we can see not only is the system usable under normal conditions, but is it also usable and can people use it properly under these sort of risky conditions, which it's supposed to protect against. Now, one problem with doing user studies where we have an adversary or an attacker or this notion of risk is that we don't wanna actually hurt the people who are in our user studies. Uh, so we don't wanna actually fish them or crack their passwords or break into their bank accounts or anything like that. Um, and so we often have to find a way to simulate the risk and um, make people feel like it's a real risk so that they will respond as they would if the risk was real. Uh, sometimes we actually deceive them uh, so they really do think it's real when it's not. 
uh, sometimes we ask them to imagine some hypothetical scenarios. So they know it's not real, but they try to think about a time when they might have been in that sort of situation or, or um, uh, try, try to uh, think about how they would respond if the threat really were real. All right, so let's talk about some studies and we will go back in time to 1999. Um, and this was one of the first well-known um, studies in usable security. Uh, and this is why Johnny can't encrypt um, a usability evaluation of PGP 5.0. Um, this was published at Usenix Security uh, 1999 and um, it won a uh, test of time award like 20 years later. Uh, so why Johnny Can Encrypt got me and many other researchers thinking about um, why is it that using encryption software and other security software is so hard and what can we do about it? Um, it's interesting to note is that 22 years later, Johnny still can't encrypt. We still have a lot of awfully unusable encryption software. Uh, you know, there, there definitely are some bright spots, some things are getting better, um, but we still have a lot of problems. And why is it that we still have these problems? Um, well, fundamentally, I think it's because we are still relying on users to do security tasks that they just aren't good at. Um, and so one example that I will highlight today is creating unique and memorable passwords. And that's a problem that we've been looking at a lot uh, in our research at Carnegie Mellon. So uh, in our research, we've seen that users have many misconceptions about passwords. So we've done studies where we invite users into our lab and we give them um, some uh, hypothetical accounts of varying degree of uh, security necessary. And we asked them to create passwords um, and to think aloud as they're doing that and tell us about the passwords that they are creating. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to observe a variety of misconceptions. Um, so a big one is that a lot of people think that keyboard patterns are secure because they seem kind of random. Um, and uh, you know, most people don't really understand randomness. So having a lot of different letters and numbers next to each other uh, that don't form a word makes it look like it's random. And we've had in our studies, and also anecdotally, um, you know, when, when you study passwords, people love to come up to you and tell you about their passwords. And I'm always like, no, no, no don't tell me your password. Um, but people do it. And, um, and it seems that this idea of, oh, I found this pattern on the keyboard and I'll, all I have to do is go diagonally up and down the keyboard and I get this random password. Um, a lot of people have this idea. Uh, so many have this idea that it's in all of the password cracking dictionaries. So this is absolutely not a secure way uh, to make passwords. Uh, it's also interesting that uh, people believe that adding an exclamation part, point on the end of their password will make it secure. Uh, we definitely have people that we've seen in our studies who will say, okay, I need to create a secure password now. And so I'm going to um, make the password monkey. Yeah, I know that's not really very secure. So I'm going to add an exclamation point on the end. Now it's secure. Um, this is also, of course, a misconception. Um, and the reason that people think this is secure is they are used to um, creating passwords and getting feedback on their passwords from the website that, that uh, they're working on. Um, and the feedback will often say things like, try adding a symbol to your password. And so they will add a symbol at the end. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, we are all attracted to exclamation points. I mean, you have a whole keyboard of symbols, but we all go for the exclamation point. Um, so there are a lot of very common patterns like that. Likewise, if you get the feedback, try adding a capital letter, we don't just go and add one on the end, we actually back, 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 go to the beginning and we capitalize the first letter. We all do it. Um, and if we're asked to add a digit, we're most likely to add the number one. And we, we've seen this um, in our data. 
Right. We did another study, um, and this was a study we did online, and we showed people pairs of passwords, and we asked them to tell us which one was stronger, um, or were they equally strong? And there was this sliding scale, and they could they could choose um, where, uh, you know, how much stronger or weaker these passwords were from each other. Uh, so here is an example uh, from the study. We gave people a pair of passwords, I love you 88, and I eat kale 88. Um, and uh, people looked at these and they saw they're the same number of letters, the same number of numbers, actually uh, the exact same digits, um, many letters, uh, you know, the same between them. And most people conclude that in fact, they are equally secure, which is actually a misconception. And the reason why uh, this is not true is because the phrase, I love you 88 is a very common phrase in passwords and I eat kale is not. So in fact, I eat kale 88 is like 4 trillion times more secure than I love you 88. Um, and, uh, you know, people are always talking about how much they love other people. Uh, it turns out that when we create passwords, we actually like to make passwords about things we like, things that have good uh, memories for us. So I love you. It doesn't matter what language it's in. People use it in their passwords. Kale is not something that people like to talk about or eat, or at least based on the um, people in my house, uh, I eat kale, nobody else seems to want to eat it. Uh, so um, that's not something that we put in passwords. And uh, the blame for a lot of our misconceptions about passwords, I think does uh, lie on password meters and the feedback that we're getting on websites. Um, we get these super useful, um, uh, feedback that says things like, your password is weak, create a stronger password. Hmm. Not quite sure what I'm supposed to do with that. So uh, based on the research and the data that we've uh, collected, uh, we actually developed our own password meter at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, you can check it out on our website. Um, and this um, password meter, uh, first of all, is more accurate than a lot of the password meters out there as far as telling you whether your password actually is strong or not. But it also gives you actionable feedback. Uh, so if you type your digits at the end of the password, it will say something like, consider inserting digits into the middle, not just at the end. And so that will lead to stronger passwords. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on exactly what makes for stronger passwords and what types of password policies will lead to the strongest passwords. And we had a paper at the ACMCCS conference um, a few months ago, which kind of summarizes about 10 years of research that we've done in this area. Um, so if you're interested in that, check that out. Another thing that we've seen in our password research is that users cope with a lot of passwords by reusing them. People are not actually going and um, uh, memorizing long lists of unique passwords. Instead, they are simply using the same password over and over again. And so we wanted to find out, well, how much are they doing that? To what extent is this actually happening? So um, we used a, um, a platform that we had uh, going for a while at Carnegie Mellon called the Security Behavior Observatory. Um, and this is a network of instrumented home Windows computers. Uh, we recruit people to be in our study and they stay in our study for months at a time. So at any given time, uh, we had about 200 active participants. And we were uh, collecting information from their computers related to security and privacy. Uh, so we had a lot of data coming in automatically. And then we could periodically send them surveys or conduct interviews with them um, in order to uh, find out why are they doing uh, the things that we are observing them doing. So among other things that we have in this data are hashed passwords. So we were able to use this in order to examine uh, password reuse um, for the passwords that people are using um, uh, at websites using the web browser on their Windows computer. So we found that on average, our participants had 26 different accounts that they were entering passwords into, um, but only 10 distinct passwords. 
So there's a lot of reuse there. Um, and then we uh, dug a bit deeper into the type of reuse. And we discovered that some people were exactly reusing the same password, and some people were partially reusing. So they might have monkey one, monkey two, monkey three. That's a partial reuse. Um, but half the time, they were doing both. So they would use monkey one and monkey two on both of those on multiple sites. So that's an exact and a partial reuse. So that was half the passwords. 16% um, were only exactly reused. 12% were only partially reused, and that left only 21% of passwords that were not being reused at all. So then we thought, well, maybe it's only at certain types of sites that people don't really feel the need for security at where they're reusing their passwords. So we checked the type of site um, for all, all the sites um, that we had passwords for, and we found that actually the um, the, the reuse was happening across almost every category of site, including shopping, education, financial, work, um, all of those sites where you might expect people might care about security, it wasn't happening. And this is a problem because password attackers are exploiting password reuse. So an attacker may have a stolen list of passwords uh, that they may crack, and then they're going to go and find out where else they can use the same passwords. So the attacker says, ah, Jim, his password is monkey one. Let me go try some online stores and see if that works. Let me try a bank or two. Maybe I'll try some employers. And, uh, and so the, the attacker is likely to crack some of these passwords and, uh, and sometimes they don't. And so the attacker may say, well, let me try some variations. Maybe it's monkey two at this site, right? And they'll crack some more. Uh, so um, uh, you can see that password reuse is uh, problematic. Um, and one potential solution to this is to just make uh, users change their passwords all the time. Uh, and we hear a lot of messaging where people say, you know, change your password. So um, there are some organizations that actually require password changes every 60 or 90 days. Um, we've had marketing campaigns. They say that passwords are like underpants. Uh, I actually think this is terrible. Passwords are not at all like underpants. Um, this is not the message that we should be giving people. Um, so, but why, why are they trying that message? Well, the idea is that if, you're, if your account has been compromised and you are not aware of it, then if you change your password, you will lock out the attackers that you didn't know were there. Um, so that, that makes some uh, logical sense. And uh, some of my friends at the University of North Carolina um, did a study uh, about 10 years ago where they tested this theory. So at the time, uh, UNC required everybody to change their passwords every three months. Um, and so they were able to get um, a, the archive of old passwords that people weren't using anymore, um, and they were all hashed. Uh, so the researchers were able to go through and crack large numbers of those passwords. Um, and then what they did is they, they wanted to see um, for the people that they had multiple passwords for in, among their cracked passwords, um, where they had you know, this every three month sequence, were they able to look at the, the old passwords that they cracked in order to predict the next password that that person created. And um, they, they used all sorts of interesting algorithms and machine learning, um, but Fundamentally, what they found is that people are making very predictable transformations to their old passwords. And this was at, at the heart of the algorithms that they came up with. So here's an example. Um, people would take a letter in the old password and capitalize it in the new one. Uh, they take a digit and they would increment it. Um, they would take a digit and they would convert it to the symbol that was on the same key as that digit. Um, and this one wasn't in, in the researcher's paper, but we've seen this as well, is that people will put the date that they changed their password. Um, uh, so in this case, I have like a month and year, um, and uh, then, then I have a unique password uh, every quarter, um, and I can easily remember it because I know which months I have to change my password.
Right. So the researchers found that, in fact, knowing prior passwords is actually very useful for predicting the next one. Um, so they simulated an online attack where the attackers um, uh, had a small number of guesses and they found that they could crack 17 percent of accounts within five guesses, um, which is kind of a lot. Um, they also simulated an offline attack. Um, and this was uh, with you know, a particular set of computing resources available at the time. They gave themselves three seconds and they were able to crack 41% of accounts. Uh, clearly, if they had more resources or more time, they, they could have cracked more. So this suggests to us that uh, if we think that forcing people to change their passwords all the time is actually going to do much for security, that mm, it doesn't seem to actually be doing as much as we think it is. Uh, so uh, when I was at the Federal Trade Commission, um, I was uh, going around to the system administrators for our various computing systems and um, telling them this, and because I was very frustrated that I, I started working for the government and immediately was given five different passwords that I had to change every 60 days. Um, and I said, why are we doing this? Um, you know, this is not actually helping security. Uh, so I wrote an article about this, a, a blog post that um, was on the front page of the FTC website. Uh, lots of people read it and passed it to their IT departments. Around the same time in the UK, um, their security people were saying the same thing. So, you know, not a unique idea. Um, we all started talking about it. Um, and a lot of organizations said, well, we have to do this because this is what the standards say. This is what NIST recommends. Um, so then in 2017, NIST actually changed their recommendations and they no longer recommend regular password expiry. So that was, that was a good thing. Um, but we still have the problem of people are nonetheless creating bad passwords. Uh, people are reusing passwords. So we still have a problem. What can we do? Uh, Two-factor authentication uh, is actually a pretty good solution. It doesn't solve 100% of the problem, but it actually helps a lot. And getting people to use password managers also helps a lot because by using password managers, people can create truly random passwords and they don't have to remember them. Um, but what we've seen is that adoption rates are actually pretty low for both two-factor authentication and password managers, um, unless you're in, a, in an organization that mandates uh, the use of two-factor authentication. Uh, but when it's voluntary, most people don't volunteer. So at Carnegie Mellon, that's a picture of CMU for those who've never been there. Um, it, that's not what it looks like today. It looks very snowy today. Um, it's a nice, nice uh, spring or summer day, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Carnegie Mellon, we adopted two-factor authentication a few years ago. Um, we adopted the uh, Duo system, which a lot of universities um, are using now. Um, and the implementation uh, at CMU was to, um, was, was to use Duo for our single sign-on system um, that we have. And uh, people um, could use um, they call the, the duo push method, um, a passcode. And we also had a feature where you could have the system remember you for 30 days. So if you use the same device to authenticate, you didn't have to keep doing the duo dialogue every time, but only once every 30 days. Uh, so we collected data during the rollout of duo at CMU. Um, there was a mandatory adoption deadline um, for people who were on the Carnegie Mellon payroll. Um, and so we, uh, uh, well, there'd been a lot of messaging up there saying, you need to get on this. You're gonna, you're gonna be required to do this at a certain point. Um, and so we surveyed people before the deadline. Um, then we surveyed people after the deadline. And we also looked at help desk and access log data. So I'm just gonna give you a few highlights of some of the things that we saw here. Um, one is that students perceive the two-factor authentication more negatively than faculty and staff. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that faculty and staff tend to, to use the same device all the time. Uh, this was me in my office at the time. 
Um, and uh, so if I use the remember me for 30 days, it did remember me for 30 days. But the students were going into different computer labs all the time. Um, they were using different devices, different IP addresses. And so they were constantly having to authenticate. Uh, we also saw that people who had never used two-factor really needed convincing. Um, they, they didn't think it was needed. They don't have, um, they don't have anything really important in their account. Uh, they heard from other people that it was a hassle, right? Um, but then we found that after people actually adopted it, it turned out it wasn't so bad. So this isn't exactly a glowing recommendation, but we saw uh, lots of comments like this. I previously assumed it would be more of a pain than it was worth. It's not actually that horrible. Uh, so that seems to be the kind of sentiment out there about two-factor authentication. Um, there are a number of things that I think organizations can do to make it less horrible, uh, to look at the actual use cases, for example, in this case, the, you know, the students in the computer labs, to try to figure out if there are ways to make it easier for people in those sorts of use cases. Um, but ultimately, if it's important to an, to an organization to have people adopt two-factor, they may have to actually require it. All right, let's look at password managers. Um, all the experts are saying, use password managers. We use them. They're great. Um, but people are not adopting them in, in large numbers. Uh, so we did a study where we interviewed people um, about why they chose to use or not use password managers. Uh, we found a bunch of reasons. One is a lot of people actually still just don't even know they exist. Um, so lack of awareness. Um, there were people who know about them, um, but they didn't really think they needed them. Um, they, they didn't think that reusing passwords was really a bad thing. Um, they also uh, said, well, if I use a password manager and it gets compromised, then I'm going to have a big problem. And so they would overestimate the risk of password manager compromise, which is fairly low. It's not zero, but it's fairly low. And they'd underestimate the risks associated with password reuse, which are actually pretty high. Uh, some people had tried password managers and found them confusing, or they had found usability and reliability problems. You know, I saved this new password and it didn't actually save and then I got locked out. Um, it was also the case that a lot of people are using password managers built into their web browsers, and a lot of them are using them for convenience, and they use them to store their bad passwords. Uh, whereas people who actually download a password manager are more likely to uh, create new strong passwords and store those in their password manager. All right, so let's turn to privacy uh, for a bit. Um, we've done a lot of work um, on privacy in my lab as well. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two types of projects, and we will start with privacy policies and nutrition labels. All right, here's an example of a privacy policy. I'm sure you've all seen policies that look roughly like this, um, and it is no wonder that people don't read them. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago now, uh, I was working with a student, Alicia McDonald, who is now a faculty member. Um, and Alicia and I were, were looking at uh, privacy policies and the problem of people not reading them. And Alicia said, let's do a thought experiment and figure out if people were to actually read them, how much time would it take? Um, and so she got a lot of data about how many different websites people visit and um, uh, also data on um, how long, how many words were in privacy policies, the average adult reading speed. And she came up with a number 244 hours per year is how long it would take on average for us to read the privacy policies at the websites we visit. Um, this is clearly ridiculous. Nobody's going to spend that much time reading privacy policies. Even me and I actually study privacy policies. Uh, so we're not the only ones who've said this is ridiculous. Um, this was a White House report um, back in um, 2014 um, that said that the idea that people read these sorts of notices is a fantasy. Only in some fantasy world uh, do people actually do this. Um, and uh, 
we we started looking at what are some alternatives to privacy notices that might give people some some more information. And um, one idea that we um, came up with is um, the idea of having a privacy meter that uh, would be would accompany search results so that when you're doing a web search, you could um, choose a search result based on how good the privacy policy is at that website. And uh, so we did some studies where we actually had people make purchases online with and without meters um, in their uh, search results. And what we found is that in fact, this works. Um, when we put salient privacy information in the search results, it actually influenced purchase decisions. And we saw that people would, would actually um, buy more expensive products uh, with from websites that had good privacy policies. Uh, so that was um, an interesting finding. And so we've been looking at, okay, how can we make privacy information more salient? So another idea that we've looked at is the idea of nutrition labels. Um, they work pretty well on food products. And so can we do the same thing for privacy? Um, can we have a standardized format? Can we use standardized language? Can we keep it brief? And then have links to the more detailed information. And so we came up with this idea of a privacy nutrition label. We did a lot of testing and iteration on it. Um, and this particular version actually um, works pretty well. Um, not that it's been adopted, but you know, as, as a, a research project, we, we found all right, there's some su success here. We're actually able to um, use this for people to understand privacy on websites better. And more recently, there's been talk of having privacy nutrition labels for IoT devices. And uh, there's been um, even some of the proposed legislation on IoT security and privacy has, um, has proposed that we have privacy and security labels with no details about what they would look like. Um, and this has happened uh, both in the US and in Europe and the UK as well. So we did a, a project where we came up with an idea for an IoT security and privacy label. And um, we, we uh, went and talked to people who had purchased IoT devices uh, about this label and uh, how they would use it. And people actually really liked the idea of the label. They weren't really quite sure what should be on the label though, because they weren't experts. And they said, we don't know what we need to know about privacy and security. Uh, so we went and did an expert study. We asked experts for what should be on the label. They knew lots of things that they wanted to see on the label. Um, in fact, too much to fit on a label. So we did uh, many iterations of this and we finally came up with this design, which has two layers. So the one on the left, the idea is that that would actually appear on product packaging or on a website. And then people could click on the link or scan the QR code and get the more detailed version that you see on the right. Um, and that has uh, also tested pretty well with consumers. And we've got lots of information about that on our website, um, including a complete specification of the label and a wizard that you can use to generate your own labels if you wanna check that out. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is icons. So um, we've all probably seen variations on this. This is, this is the onion, so it's obviously a joke, um, but people see, uh, lots of ads that, that perplex them. The shoes following them around the internet is a common thing. And I must admit, I shop for shoes online and I have lots of shoes following me around the internet. But I'm not confused by it because I'm aware that there is a symbol that I can click on to find out about this tracking. And I will point it out for you right here and we'll blow it up. Um, this is known as the ad choices icon. Um, but we have seen that most people are completely unaware of this icon. It may look vaguely familiar, but they don't really know what it is. Um, and many people are actually afraid to click on it. So we did a study and this study was done almost 10 years ago, um, but we actually have some more recent data which shows that um, pretty much the same thing still holds. Um, we did a study about how much people recognize this icon. 
And so uh, we showed people uh, in this online study ads where we put the icon in the corner of the ad and we put a tagline next to it. And we have a bunch of different taglines that we experimented with. Um, and uh, ad choices is the one that you usually see, but we have others that the industry sometimes uses. And then we had some that we made up and sometimes we just had no tagline at all. And then we asked people questions like this what would happen if you clicked on the icon? And um, we got answers like this. So about half the people said that more ads would pop up. Um, the other half said it will take you to a page where you can buy advertisements on this website, right? Those are both completely wrong. Um, only 27% of people had the correct answer, which is it will take you to a page where you can opt out of tailored ads. So this isn't really very good. 27% correct, you would not pass my class. Um, so then we looked at, well, what if we put different words next to this icon? So if we change the words to configure ad preferences, people actually do a lot better. Now we still only have 50% correct, which is still not great, but it's a lot better than 27% correct. And this suggests that if we spent more time uh, developing and evaluating and iterating on these sorts of icons and the phrases next to them, we could actually do better at communicating with people about their privacy choices. So we've been continuing to look at how people exercise privacy choices on websites. We've found that a lot of the current opt-outs are hard to find. They take many steps. There's very little consistency, even in the types of words that are used in privacy policies to describe privacy choices. So we're, we're working on developing and evaluating best practices. Um, and we think that standardization and automation, so things can happen automatically in your web browser, would really help a lot. The, the last thing I'm going to mention um, is the California Consumer Privacy Act um, and the fact that it calls for an icon or a button. So the CCPA says that uh, websites need to have a link to do not sell my personal information um, and they may optionally have a button or logo. So this got us thinking, well, what should that button or logo look like? Uh, we reached out to the California Office of the Attorney General and asked them, and they said, we don't know. So we thought, well, maybe we could do some work to help them out and come up with a good icon or button. Uh, so we developed a set of possible do not sell my personal information icons. Uh, we iterated on the icon designs through multiple rounds of testing. We did a lot of online testing with Amazon Mechanical Turk users. Um, we also looked at alternative taglines to do not sell my personal information. Um, the one we, we found worked especially well was privacy options. Um, we submitted three reports to the California Office of the, of the Attorney General over several months. Um, and uh, as of December, their current draft regulations recommend using our icon, which is this blue icon you see here. So this has been um, well tested in our studies. Um, they haven't issued the final regulations yet, so still could change. Um, but we're, we're hoping that, that this will actually make the final regulations. We also think that this icon doesn't need to just be used in California and it shouldn't just be used for this particular choice about selling personal information. We'd like to see privacy options used everywhere as kind of a universal um, indicator that this is where you go on a website if you wanna make choices about the, your privacy or your personal information. So uh, that, that's what we're hoping for. All right, um, I think I will wrap it up here and be happy to take your questions. Um, this is a, a picture of uh, some of the students in my lab. It's actually a couple years old and um, obviously I can't get a new photo because we're not in person, uh, but here, here uh, is our old photo with our lab unicorn and some pointers to where you can find uh, more of our papers and learn about our programs at Carnegie Mellon. So I'm looking forward to your questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Craner. You are, were speaking exactly to the topic of our seminar series and questions keep on coming. There's several questions revolving around password managers, but we, before we go there, um, let's, let's attend to this one. Uh, the question goes as, as follows. 
what seemingly innocuous online practices frequently put humans at risk to invasion of privacy. And I'm assuming the attendee is asking about innocuous online practices of maybe industry partners or um, anyone who manages these for authentication. So, so uh, is this specifically with, with authentication or, or just more generally? Well, I'm guessing uh, the question is about uh, the, the websites uh, that are in some hidden way actually putting us at risk. Uh, and what are those practices that we should be aware of? Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, a lot of websites uh, rely on various third party organizations um, uh, for revenue. Um, so they, uh, they use advertising um, that they don't host themselves, they're using third party services. And um, these advertising companies um, uh, use uh, targeted advertising, which requires a lot of data about where you go and what you're interested in. Um, so uh, a lot of the websites you visit uh, are collecting lots of data and building profiles of you. And those profiles may be useful for more advertising, but they could also be sold and used for other purposes that, that we may have no idea um, what they are. And so it's in fact, you can, you can buy um, lists of people who have particular uh, mental health issues, for example. Um, and so, you know, this data can be used for all sorts of purposes. Thank you. Um, now we have a whole suite of questions relative to password managers, which means people are uh, at least excited about those. Um, and and uh, some of those revolve around the, the question, who guards the guards? So um, here's the question. I have been using a password manager with 30 character random passwords, uh, but my wonder is what if the password manager gets hacked? And another question is, is, is similar. Do password manager software provide a rich target for hackers? If they break one password for the password manager, then they get access to them all. Yeah, so that's a concern a lot of people have. Um, so there, there's two types of ways a password manager could get hacked. One is that the password manager company, there could be some flaw in their software or their system that would allow someone to basically hack all of the password managers that that company makes. Um, if that happens, um, and sadly it could happen and, and in the past has happened, if that happens, um, if it's a reputable password manager, they will let you know right away. Um, it will also probably be on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, so you, you will know um, and you will be able to respond quickly and hopefully faster than the attackers can make use of that. And um, in the past, when there have been breaches related to password manager companies, um, people have not actually gotten hurt um, because there has been a very prompt response, um, which shut things down very quickly. Uh, the other possibility is that somebody just gets uh, into your particular password manager. So maybe somebody um, is able to see you type the password for your password manager um, and they can get into that. Um, so that's also possible. Um, it's uh, fairly unlikely in that, um, you know, if you have a good password for your password manager, it may be hard for people to see you type it in. Um, and you should uh, certainly be looking over your shoulder, you know, when you're typing in your password manager password. Um, but it can happen. Um, and um, now we look at the relative probabilities. Okay, what is the probability that that's going to happen versus what is the probability that one of the 50 websites that all use the same password is going to get hacked? Um, and most experts will, say, will tell you that the probability of a website data breach is much higher than a breach of your personal password manager password. Thank you. Uh, it's all about reducing risk. There's nothing that is 100% safe. Yeah. So it's, it's all about reducing the risk. Um, uh, another question on, on this same uh, uh, chain of questions. Uh, Two-factor auth uh, authentication is a service initiated site has to support it. The passwords are user initiated. Uh, we choose our passwords. Could those be flipped? What if website choose passwords for us? Are there any attempts to allow users to add 
two-factor authentication to otherwise unaware, uninterested website. Um, all right, so so uh, I guess there there's two questions there. Um, you know, assigning seven. users passwords. Um, yeah, you can make sure they have strong passwords if you assign them. The users will hate you for it, um, unless they have password managers, in which case, great, I'll put in my password manager. Um, Two-factor authentication uh, helps a lot. And um, uh, you know, some people argue that if you have two-factor authentication, maybe you don't need to have as strong a password. Um, and uh, to some extent that there might be some truth there. Um, the thing is uh, two-factor authentication uh, protects against some threats, but not all threats. So it's not a perfect solution. So um, I think you can maybe dial things back a little as far as you know, just how secure your password needs to be if you have two-factor, but you still don't want a easily guessed password. Uh, thank you for that answer. I noticed that number of times the, the one that I'm using, which will remain a secret, uh, actually uh, is not accepted by a number of websites. Uh, it doesn't pass them the, the mustard. So this is my question. Uh, um, then how much can we trust these uh, random generators? Um, yeah, so uh, most of the, the password generators um, are are good. They, they may not be perfect randomness, but, but they're pretty good. The reason why they usually don't pass is because the, um, the websites have arbitrary rules. And so, you know, the website might say you must have a, a digit, an uppercase letter, a lowercase letter, and a symbol, right? You may have a password that is all lowercase letters, but it's 30 random lowercase letters. Right. That, that's a strong password, but it that's, doesn't follow yeah. the rules right, of that right. particular website. Right, 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 right. 30 characters should be good. Yeah. So you were talking about a number of, of, of usability studies, which is very intriguing. And this question is addressing that. Could you please highlight more on how did you conduct the experiments on these usability studies? For example, what is the typical size of user study? What type of users you recruited? CMU student staff versus industrial employees. How did you recruit them? What incentives you used? What about IRB and so on? I think you addressed some of those, but it's it's a never ending question. I think we'll all agree. Yeah, yeah. So so every study is different. Um, there, you know, I, I can't tell you that there's no magic that you always do it like this. Uh, we have done studies that are fairly small and have say 15 uh, people who come to our lab. We've done online studies with thousands of people. Um, so it really varies quite a bit. Uh, we always use IRB. So our institutional review board reviews everything that we do before we do it. Um, but yeah, the size of the study really depends. Um, is it exploratory where we're just trying to get some ideas of what people do? Or are we trying to get um, data that will allow us to test a hypothesis or figure out how prevalent a particular thing is in the population? Um, we do try to use diverse populations for most of our studies. Um, obviously, when we were studying the adoption of Duo at CMU, we only used CMU people, um, but that's unusual. Usually, we are either looking for people throughout the Pittsburgh area where we are, um, or if it's an online study throughout the country or the world, depending on, on what uh, we're looking for. Uh, generally, because we're doing our studies in English, we limit to English-speaking people. Of course, of course. Thank you for your answer. Now, here's a question on scalability. Um, do you think there's any way to motivate people out of bad passwords on a large scale, parenthesized, say over half of the US population is using consistently good passwords? Would regulation help? Would more effective password meters help, like the one you discussed? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, I think lots of things will help. Will, will you get to 50%? I, I don't know. Um, uh, I think better password meters, our, our, our data from our research shows that better password meters do help. Um, and we, this is a study we've done with thousands of people and better password meter, meters most definitely do help. Um, but you know, how much? I don't know. Um, regulation. Um, it's hard to know exactly what the law would say. Um, 
and uh, it's also the case that that password security is a moving, you know, it's constantly moving. And so if you were to mandate a particular password policy or a particular password technology, it would quickly be out of date. Um, and so uh, it's difficult to have a law that says, you know, all businesses must have these kinds of passwords. Um, and it's also maybe not the highest priority for if we're going to have security mandates for companies, there, there are other things that I'd like them to do first. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's part of the package of security and there are things we can do to improve it. Chasing tails constantly. So now we're moving on to a, 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 a different type of authentication approaches such as biometric authentication. The question is, um, what would be best when evaluating usability and security aspects when it comes to biometric authentication? Yeah, um, so we've done some looking at biometric authentication and um, uh, you know, it, it's in some ways, it's the same kind of issues that you have, you know, we, we do need to look at are people able to use it um, with biometrics, there's also the issue of acceptance that there are um, a lot of uh, biometrics that people find scary, um, or they have a lot of privacy concerns about so that becomes a factor. Um, there are also issues of, uh, of accessibility. Um, and uh, and cost of the systems, um, and and then there's a trade-off of of all of these factors versus you know the security of it. You know, how secure is it really? Um, so we did a study this point like six years ago when um, phones first started having um, biometrics built into the phone. Maybe it was more than six years ago. Um, and so we had people trying to unlock their phones. Um, and in the study, we had them do it while walking and carrying a bag, right? We had them put on moisturizer in their hands and try to do it. We had them do it in low light situations. Because we were looking at all the real life situations where people unlock phones with biometrics to see where, where is there a problem uh, here and then we looked at you know the data on security so that's kind of what what needs to be done thank you very much uh, unfortunately we are getting uh, to to close close the uh, closer closer to the end of the talk but we have questions keep on coming um, here's a, a, a practical one uh, the, 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 the attendee is thanking for informative uh, talk and, and is asking, I, I wonder if you could speak to creating unique passwords based on a personal quote unquote code. For example, adding the last three letters of the website's name to your password. So each one is technically unique. I'm guessing the, the attendee is trying to figure out a way to still remember uh, uh, and, and, and keep that way passwords in, in, in their heads. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, so a lot of people, especially people with more technical backgrounds, do something like that, um, where they have a root password that that they um, that they use everywhere, but they're adding extra letters or digits somewhere to the password. Um, but it's partially now reused. <laughs> it's now partially reused. So that's a, that's a great example of partial reuse. Um, how bad is that? Uh, so it it really depends on what your on the details of your algorithm. Um, you know, I know people who tell me, well, I take you know the, the three letters from the website and then I permute them in some <laughs> way, and I don't put them at the end. I sprinkle them in the middle. Right, right. If you can keep all that track of that in your mind chances are you probably have a fairly decent password. Um, but the people who are just like, well, I take the first letter of the website and I tack it on the end. All right, that's probably no good. Um, you know, in part because, uh, you know, there are many websites that start with the same letter. So you are actually exactly reusing um, when you do that. Um, so yeah, I would say it depends. Wonderful. Uh, so, uh, uh, Louise, shall we keep on going? We have a couple of more interesting questions. Or... Yes, well, um, I think we have to wrap up um, because I don't want to uh, to take too much of uh, everyone's time. I think there will be you know, questions would keep coming. And uh, Laurie, thank you so much for this uh, really, really fascinating uh, talk. I will now change all my passwords to IETK088. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Dr. Craner. 
Thank you very much, Louise. Thank you very much, attendees. Um, and uh, please mark your calendars for the next month presentation. Dr. John Doyle from Caltech will be speaking on universal laws, architectures, and systemic fragilities in biomed, neurotech, and social systems. So mark your calendars. Thank you very much, and have a rest, great rest of the day, everybody. Thank you, Millers. Stay warm, everyone.